Hello everybody, welcome. My name is Luke Potkin. I'm the Fair Director for the other art fairs here in Australia. And welcome to our virtual editions. Um, it's now been a week, almost to the hour, since we opened the doors of our in real life fair here in Sydney uh, at the magnificent venue of the Cutaway. And we're also now three days in to our virtual edition where we've recreated the Cutaway in this digital space for you all to enjoy from the comfort of your own home. So um, if you're new to the fair, this is your chance to discover some of the artists we had on show, um, or if even if you attended the fair and uh, there's an artist uh, you're still keen to check out and maybe you're ready to make that purchase, this is the place where you can do all of that. Um, so we've split the show into three bite-sized chunks for you. Uh, each of them has over 30 artists for you to discover and enjoy. Um, and we're going to show you some of the interactive components of that when we enter room three in a moment. Um, and so I do encourage you all to check out the other rooms. But as I say, for today, we're going to take a delve inside room three. Just going to click on the door here and see what lurks inside. So once you click through, you're going to find yourself in room three. As I say, you've got artists on either side of you for you to go and discover. There's a couple of ways you can navigate your way around this space. Uh, the arrows on the on the right here will allow you to navigate as you wish and check, turn the camera around. On a mobile, it's very easy to do as well. Um, so I encourage you to test that out and you can make your way and see what comes along as you explore the space. And the other thing you can do is you can hit the artist list here. Everyone that's in room three uh, is displayed on this list. Um, so you can check out some of the features we have available. For example, Sarch the Arts have created their own space. They've created some collections by price. So you can find art that you love at the price that you can afford, which is um, you know, a really exciting way to see a few different artists all displayed together. We also, in room three, have our guest artist, Brandon Boyd. Now, get, Brandon Boyd is the lead singer of Incubus, and he showed his work in Australia for the very first time last weekend at the other art fair. Um, and you can check out and buy his work, what, what's still available. And tomorrow we're gonna have an Ask Me Anything feature going on where you can come back and Brandon Boyd is gonna be asking questions from visitors, questions they pose to him during the show. So I encourage you to come and check that out tomorrow. And finally, the other person I want to draw your attention to before we go and meet our esteemed lineup of real art artist for us to talk to is Mark Amatic. Now, Mark Amatic plays with augmented reality. Um, and it's a it was a really fun and interactive space that we had at the show. Uh, and we've recreated it here in our virtual edition as well. Uh, you can see their Moving Marvels app. You can download that onto your phone using Google Play or App Store. Um, and you can actually go up to each of these artworks, hold your device to the screen, and those artworks will come to life. So I really encourage you to, to have a play around with that and see what it's got in store. And those works are also available for you to own in your own home. And what a talking piece that would be displayed on your walls. So we know where we're going. First of all, we're gonna go and see Josh Dykegraaf, who is one of our artists who was at the fair last weekend. It was his first time with us actually at the other art fair. And he got an incredible reaction. So Josh, if you're there, do come and say hello and tell us all about it. Hello. Hello, Josh. Uh, so uh, Luke, to get us started, could you uh, head over, there's a time lapse over on the left side, the far yes, left piece. Of course. Here we go. Cool. So, so this is a chance for you to get a bit of a sense of how Josh's work is created. So do you want to talk us through it, Josh? Oh yeah. So I'm a <laughs> photographic manipulation artist. Um, all, of my, all of my work is a series based on my photography. Um, each piece takes the form of an animal uh, recreated from some other kind of texture that I've chosen. Um, I'll start by shooting a reference image of the animal that I'd like to create. Usually it's the, the, uh, usually that animal is in a zoo. Um, sometimes I'll find them in the wild, but I'm not gonna pretend to be Joe Wildlife Photographer hiding in the grass. Um, I'll then pair that animal with some other kind of texture that I think it has some kind of commonality with. So that could be it that I've created from the animal's um, natural habitat, or it could be that I've noticed some kind of visual similarity. 
Um, once I've chosen that particular um, texture that I want to work with, um, I'll then go out and shoot a few hundred, maybe a few thousand shots of that uh, landscape. Um, could you hit uh, play again on it, please, Luke? Uh, I'll, I'll go. Um, so I'll sift through hundreds, maybe thousands of shots that I've shot while I'm out hiking, um, and then go looking through them for, pe for parts of the photos that I think correspond to different parts of the animal's anatomy. I'll then cut them out and layer them over the top of that reference image that I've shot. Um, as, as you can see, that's what's happening here um, in that time lapse. Uh, the whole process it's in, takes... It's incredible detail. And I think the thing that people really struggle with when they're looking at work is just getting a sense of how that comes together because it's so it's so clever, it's so interesting, but there's a real kind of mystery behind how you get from, from that those initial images to this finished piece. Um, it must oh, take yeah. a great amount of time. Oh yeah, it's, it takes maybe 30 to 60 hours. And usually it's a couple of thousand layers in Photoshop. Uh, like my background is, um, I come from a, like from an from an advertising background, doing like manipulations and retouching for that kind of work, and this is me applying that kind of skill set um, to my personal one. Um, Let, and let's take a look at some of the other images so and get a sense of that, um, because I think it's great the way you're sort of bringing in the own, the natural. I think the wombat is a good example of that, where you're bringing in the natural. Oh yeah. Uh, so do you want to oh, yeah. talk about this? Oh, absolutely. Um, so th uh, this piece is named Drogedy. It's um, based on the Grampians here in Victoria. Um, I've, as I said, I've got, I went out, for, went out hiking and shot several hundred shots and then layered out over that form. The whole piece ori um, originated from basically noticing the rock formations that you see um, make, compose the ears of the wombat. Um, I saw those out in the wild and um, it's and thought, well, basically they look like they could be the ears of an animal. Um, my creative process is a little bit like um, cloud gazing, how you like stare at the clouds and find other forms in them. I stare at landscapes and different textures and see that kind of thing. Um, That's like quite interesting. Just, I, I did wonder whether that, which stage in the process that happened, whether you saw um, you know, you captured lots of imagery and then you decided on the piece and you found things that would fit, but it sounds like from that, that actually the starting point is seeing those in their finished form that would, and that kind of inspires the piece. Yeah, usually, it, uh, so I, like, it can go either way, but usually it's, I'll be out hiking somewhere and see something, and then I get the idea. Um, so that rock looks like a wombat ear. I'm going to work with that. Kind of the starting point, yeah. And then I just kind of, <laughs> roll with it from there um and and i think uh, also I, I guess your work's got a lot to say i mean we we've talked a little about it this week already with some other artists in terms of how we were all deeply affected by the bushfires of uh that we saw at the start of last well the end of 2019 the start of 2020 um and how widespread the impact that was so you know some of your pieces really have a message in them in, in terms of drawing attention to that important issue that i know you're very passionate about. Do you want to talk a bit more about some of those? Absolutely. So the pieces in the dark frames are part of a bushfire series that I was working on uh, in the first half of last year. Um, for each, for all of them, I traveled out to East Gippsland where the big fires were here in Victoria. Um, and I, for this series, I purposefully set out um, to create something that spoke to the reaction that we were all feeling to that, like some of the news that we heard, um, like koalas are currently projected to become extinct in the wild in the next few decades. Um, and they've estimated something like 3 billion animals were killed in the fires. Um, given the work I've, I've given the series I've been developing, I felt like I was pretty well positioned to create something that spoke to that. Um, so for these ones, I traveled out to the fire fields and shot ton of material of the left so in the case of the koalas on the left there i shot some of those burnt landscapes for the black cockatoo that you see uh center screen I, I gathered up um some burnt leaves that i found um on the like on the ground there um and then brought them back to me 
brought them back to Melbourne with me and shot them under studio conditions. Um, so I could get some uniform lighting um, and, that, and choose the angles that I wanted in camera rather than manipulating it in Photoshop and then cut them out and layered them over that form. Um, the piece on the right comes from a later trip. I, I, uh, I travelled out to East Gippsland again a few weeks after the fires had passed through. I don't know if you've ever seen if you've ever seen a gum tree after after a bushfire, but it shoots off this amazing, brilliant red growth um, that you only see for like the week after the fire. Um, it's kind of like a stopgap measure to get it through this immature growth that gets it through the short term, um, and like it's just you don't often see that um, in Australian flora. Um, and I also wanted to, to create something that was a little bit more hopeful, I guess. Um, let something to do with like that regrowth that we see. Yeah, and I think, I, and go, even back, going back to the black hook too, similarly, it's like it, it has that air of kind of the, the phoenix rising from the ashes, doesn't it? And, and, and sort of has that sense of hope. Um, yeah. And I think what's, what's great about it is with these images is that you're capturing the beauty whilst also really sending home that message of, you know, the, the bleakness of it, but, but you're conveying that through a beautiful image and actually the message being we need to protect these incredible creatures that um, we're so lucky to yeah. have. Um, actually, at the fair, um, I was approached by somebody, from, someone from Wires, uh, the Wildlife Rescue Group. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, might be seeing quite a bit more of this work in the future. Oh, great. Okay, yeah, we've worked with them in the past. Uh, yeah, well, off the back of last year's fires. Um, and they do incredible work with, with saving the, the habitat of these these precious creatures we have here. Um, well, thank you so much, Josh. I mean, it's really fascinating. Nice. I do encourage people, um, as well as you saw that, that brief time lapse there, if you check out um, Josh's Meet the Others video, um, which you can do on any of our artist booths over here um there's some more overlaying of that works so you can get a sense more of a sense of the process that goes in to creating it um and again with any of our artists if you want to schedule appointments to chat to them more about it the let's chat function there if you click on that button they schedule schedule appointments you can book in or if you just have one very quick question you want to get across or you want the artist to reach out to you um if you hit the envelope icon and you can send your question it'll go directly to in this case josh and uh, they'll be able to come back to you with any answers. And as you can see, there we've also got opportunities to follow our artists on Instagram, so you can you can see their journey as it continues, and maybe see a, a co collection in co collaboration with Wires, perhaps in the future. From what you said, oh yeah, I hope that, I hope yeah. that happens. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that, Josh. <laughs> we're going to make our way on, and uh, we're going to go and visit Meg Gallagher. Are you here? Hello. Nick? Yes, she is. Hello. Hi. How are we doing? I'm good. good. So um, I guess I was what I was thinking to start talking about and was really the relaying some of those conversations that I would have quite often at the physical fair. Mm, yeah. Um, because it was quite fascinating to me, I guess, the reactions I got from people and what they did kind of want to ask and what they were curious about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Go ahead. So for me, I mean, the first thing that people did when they kind of came in and they were kind of looking closely was there were quite a lot of people were kind of curious about what I would actually paint on. So I used denim as my base. And so instead of using a canvas, um, I, I've worked in the fashion industry for years. And so I kind of, you know, after 10 years of kind of understanding the perils of mass production in clothing, I, I just knew how much kind of excess fabric was always left over. And so it was kind of sadly easy for me to get all of these off cuts of denim that would usually just go to waste. And um, for years, I've just always worked in textile design and about washing and different shades and everything. So uh, this was when I got back into painting, I guess this was my, my happy place and my kind of what I felt really comfortable in and yet also felt challenged, you know, going into the using painting as my new medium. So um, yeah, a lot of people were quite interested in that because some people thought, is it a silkscreen? Have I done splattered paint? It was kind of, 
Um, I was surprised, I guess, if you don't work with denim every day, perhaps you don't see that as clearly as maybe I assumed. Um, well, no, I think I think the big that, that that's how I felt looking at you know it, the, you would not expect denim to provide such a a great canvas, and yet you know yeah. you absolutely use it so effectively. Yeah, um, exactly. It's hard for people to even know in in the in the first moment that that's what you're working with. Yeah, I mean, to me, it gives me such a fun playing ground in terms of um, like I have you know some control over it, but not a huge amount in terms of like. I start my paintings by kind of just having this blank piece of fabric and I'll, I'll kind of lay it over rocks and I'll bleach it and then I'll dye it and then I'll put it through the washing machine and then I'll paint again and then I'll put it through the washing machine again and I kind of do these yeah like runs of you know wash treatments and different things just to kind of create the initial energy that I want. And so it's I won't actually start painting the composition until I'm kind of happy with this sheet of fabric with all of these kind of textures and movement because I feel like unless that kind of shows a bit of energy um, then I'm kind of happy to see what I can then place on that with the compositions and I kind of then will choose my figures to see which one will fit in with the movement of the bleach and the dye and everything to see kind of which they you know which reacts well to it um, so that was you know uh, that's kind of a, a lot of the conversations I had at the fair was about that process and people were just kind of fascinated with how much I would you know wash my paintings until I get to this point where I go okay no more washing you have to leave it and and treat it like a serious precious painting and so um, and yeah I mean it, as someone with a three-year-old son you don't need more excuses to have, have to do more washing I'm sure yeah. <laughs> it's that like guy I'll let him come down to the studio with me and he's allowed to play around until I get to the point where I'm like okay no these are my fragile paint paintings now you can't touch them whereas before I'm happy because he can kind of create some funny mistakes on them but there's a point where I have to tell him no 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 this is so not going in the wash <laughs> those are the precious ones so that's quite interesting so the way that the the denim actually reacts to that process actually informs the finished the finished work yeah I think um, because sometimes I go, oh man, that looks like a bit of a night sky or that looks like hills or that to me just looks like kind of lightning or, you know, I will kind of go, yeah, they, and it will inform whether I'm going to do landscape or portrait just with the way that it will kind of, yeah, the movement of the way I kind of run the bleach or the dye over top. So I definitely think as I've gone, I've been much more, I'm just, I'm just learned to be open towards what I create. Like I'm not sure, like I'm not kind of closed off and trying to create something particular until I get to the point of where I'm picking my figure. And then once I'm applying the paint, I definitely then want to make sure I'm kind of blocking out the areas I want. And the, I'm really obsessed about choosing the right colors and mixing the right colors. I kind of never use a color straight from the box or the, the tub. Like I always mix a color. Like I think I've just been working with color for so long in the fashion industry that for me, color is so key to try and kind of get right. So um, once I do all the kind of textural work, then I move on to making sure I've got that figure and the color right. Um, a lot of people, when they were looking at my show, there was a few pieces, especially those pieces in the middle, the ones with the pink and the white, and then the blue ones next to it. Um, everyone would kind of come in and half the people would see a landscape straight away and then half the people would actually see the nude figure but it was quite interesting like I actually I was really I was like I was really happy with how many people would just see a landscape because to me I wanted them just to see this like kind of this form and mm. the idea was to have this kind of bodyscape in my head um, but so I was kind of happy when some people just thought oh my god I just thought it was like rolling hills so that was quite interesting how many like how many conversations I had about so many people not actually seeing the figures in my pieces until they kind of would step back I guess their eyes get drawn to all the different textures and different kind of parts and then they kind of take a moment to see it so yeah absolutely I think it's nice then to have that second layer that then they get to appreciate it on a whole new level when they yeah uh, when that realization is made yeah, 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 yeah. So that was, yeah, and I like that because to me, um, like I think I've always, I mean, I've always had a connection towards like doing 
these nudes and these figures and the bodies. But to me, it's always been more about creating this kind of feeling or like an energy, not towards like overtly trying to just show off the body. It's more about what the viewer would feel when they see it. So, and I also feel like, you know, with nature and landscapes and stuff, it's kind of similar, right? Like you kind of have a similar connection towards nature and landscape so I think to me they kind of hold a similar feeling there um yeah so that was an interesting like there was some interesting conversations about that just to what I think people were reacting well to the kind of abstract ways of it and mm. the textures and the tones and kind of everyone had their own point of view yeah I guess the ambiguity of some of the poses yeah. you know to one person it could be graceful to another person it you know it, it could be sexual to another person it could totally. be uh, serene or you know it, yeah. yeah it's um it's lovely when they, they sort of they've got that the ambiguity that people can take their own um their own stance and for you then obviously coming taking these off cuts of denim I guess that makes it a really interesting point and then turning them into something that in some way depicts the natural landscape is that something purposeful or accidental in terms of you know talking more about our our effect we have on the wider planet and the surrounds yeah I mean I think I definitely um I definitely over the last couple of years have felt very much aware of my input into the environment and working in the fashion industry can be a bit of a catch 22, you know, everyone goes, Oh, wow, that's really exciting. That's great. And then you go, yeah, it's just, there's a, there's a lot of clothes out there in the world. And, um, you know, just that, just that feeling of creating excess is just can get quite um, heavy on you and kind of, it's not exactly, a, it kind of, yeah, I don't know, takes the charm out of maybe being creative. So uh, when I came to doing my art, I guess for me, it was just like a really nice chance to try and use a different process and to try and, I guess, take the excess of what I see in the fashion industry and like try and do something with it. Um, you know, I know I'm doing like, you know, a tiny impact, um, but it's just, it's something that I can do. And like, everyone can't do these huge sweeping um grand gestures towards the environment or, well not everyone can but um if this is my way of trying to think of a different way of how I can create my art and not be kind of using a lot of new material and um kind of feeding into that kind of excessive situation so it's definitely something on my mind and then I think um I don't know I think with the that kind of my that connection towards nature and landscape and everything like I mean, I grew up in New Zealand on a farm. And so I think I was brought up to always, I guess, respect nature. And um, even for, like, it's like I was always brought up to respect, you know, the land you have. And so I think I kind of for a while forgot that when I was just chasing, you know, the career in fashion. And so I think it's not until recently, the last couple of years, which I was just really wanted to get back into my painting. I think I also then was also craving that kind of um craving those kind of landscapes and that connection towards nature as well yeah not not realizing I think how much affected me growing up you know you kind of go through a stage in your 20s thinking that it doesn't maybe matter as much I just I personally you know not maybe being so aware and then now I no, think I think I think, I, I think a lot of people can relate to that I think it's been something that we've all had to kind of you know really try and tackle in our own lives head on and like mm. you say it may not be you're not going to solve the, the 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 impact that the fashion industry has on, on you know on your own but what you can do through your work you know and through your art is inspire people to make their small differences as well and yeah. that's how we you know going back to the same conversation with with josh really that we have this you know issue you know we've shown how in a year we can have, we can really as a global community be affected by the same issue and everyone mm. tackle that same issue together uh with something like the you know vaccines and, and what have you and actually before that we already had this issue to tussle with and now it's yeah. the right time perhaps certainly here in australia we're, we're feeling like we're, we've sort of moved on from that a little bit to get back to this issue which is just as urgent yeah. uh, and i think you know the fact that we have artists like yourself and josh you know tackling those issues head on um 
you know, is a good way to to kind of inspire people. So thank you so yeah. much for, for letting us You're see welcome. it. And um, again, Meg's available if you want to ask questions or anything like that, you can ask them on the chat here or um, submit questions via the envelope icon on her stand or book appointments. Um, and we'll invite her back at the end just to say a little goodbye. But thank you very much for that, Meg. You're welcome. We'll now make our way to see Morgan Stokes. Luke, hi. How are you going? Morgan. How are you doing? Yes, very well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. No, my pleasure. Um, so we uh, we talked a bit. I, well, I certainly talked a few, few artists this week about how events of last year have kind of taken their their art in in a different direction, and that has taken numerous twists and turns. I think yours is a particularly interesting one. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about that. How, what, um, what what impact are we talking about, and how has it created this new body of work that you have here? Yeah, I think it was pretty pretty significant for me. I think as um, as most people experience a shift in their in their lives, I just really started to reconsider my whole artistic practice. And previously, to so about a year ago, I was just working in sort of figurative um, realism and surrealism um, painting, um, which is very precise, um, and you have to pay a lot of attention looking at um, images and once COVID hit and we were basically separated from everyone that we loved and knew um, and the screen became the primary mode of communication, um, I just started to get this cabin fever looking at my screen all the time. It was like I was trapped in this in this box and um, I didn't have a choice and I guess that's what spurred me on to reconsider my practice and what I was doing um, because I realized what I liked about painting wasn't necessarily representing an image. It was the fact that it was a physical object um, in front of me. And so that started getting me thinking about this concept that I've been um, thinking about for the past year or so, which I call uh, the virtual gaze, um, which is how we're becoming just attuned to seeing things as images and not necessarily objects. Um, and so how I've, Adapt or how I'm using that in my work is um, exploring the subtle nuances of um, materiality and texture um, that a painting usually comprises of. So I'll look at things such as the canvas itself or the properties of paint or um, the frame, so the actual structure that um, the painting is made from. Um, and so all of these different works, um, although I'm, I'm coming from, uh, they all sort of look different, even though maybe similar uh, color palette, uh, I'm coming from the same place, the same conceptual place. Um, yeah. It's kind of deconstructing that physical embodiment of, of the artistic work. So should we take a look at some of these? I think they're quite bold yeah, in the way that you're sort of playing with that. Um, uh, one, <laughs> it's hard to f fully demonstrate this on screen, perhaps, which is ironic in the context of everything you've said there about looking at these images through the screen, which I guess is exactly the point, but do you want to just give someone a, a better explanation of how this artwork is represented in its real form and, um, and what, what yeah. you want someone to take away from seeing this piece? Yes, that's the other point. Thank you for reminding me. We are, as artists, we're expected to photograph and share things online. Um, and that's just a part of being a contemporary artist. And I'm interested in how the physical piece is translated on into this virtual version. Um, and so it's this really uncanny, um, and I guess ironic, but also completely fitting experience walking around this virtual fair um, to see these digital representations of these um, physical objects. Um, and so this, this painting that you've picked here is the perfect example because um, it's just, Tra uh, almost transparent silk stretched across um, stretcher bars um, and silk is this really beautiful material which has like celestial qualities it kind of glows depending on how the light is um, looking at it um, and what I've done is I've applied very gentle sprays uh, with a spray artist spray paint um, in white and different colors um, onto the surface itself as well as uh, very gentle um, 
ch white charcoal marks. And so this painting is essentially a completely different experience looking online than it is in real life, um, even though I see them as the same artwork. Um, but in real life, it really depends on how the angle that you're looking at the painting, um, the type of light that's on the painting. So if there's light streaming in from the side, you'll see a completely different um, surface to uh, otherwise. So that's just sort of how I'm exploring, um, yeah, the different physical properties of what makes up a painting. So that, that's the thing, I suppose, in, in, your, in many ways, asking people to question art as a form in itself, and, and certainly in this modern age. So you're really just um, highlighting all the pitfalls in uh, running a virtual edition of an art fair, Morgan. You're really not, <laughs> not, not doing us any help whatsoever. <laughs> No, no, uh, no. no, but we're, it's, it's great to be asking those questions, getting people to ask those questions. And it's really exciting, bold stuff. Do, we, do, we, do you want to draw our attention to any of the other pieces you think particularly um, hone in on, on, on this, this conceptual collection? Um, possibly. The, the, I, I mean, they're all different expressions, but maybe the, um, the brown one um, is also a good example. The um, history of your entire life recorded against your will. Um, that's the title. Um, and this one is an exploration of the properties of paint. Uh, so I've used about 12 layers of um, acrylic and oil paint um, interspersed with transparent layers of um, transparent gesso. Um, and the I've actually integrated these areas of yellow ochre and these orange areas, but once you look at it from front on, it's sort of consumed in this super rich uh, raw umber color. Um, but this is similar to uh, the silk where it is completely dependent on the light source that is hitting it and the angle that you're viewing the painting um, that you'll see different things. And I think that's just the magical properties of paint, which is sort of lost uh, in the, in this, sort of digitization of um of our lives um and it, maybe, maybe i'm technophobic maybe that's what this outcome is but i i just am trying to remind myself but also other people um just anybody looking at my work that painting is a physical act and so um yeah in doing that, that I'm not afraid to like show the mistakes that I've made. So um, if you want to click across to the um, the big work, uh, yeah, that one. one. Um, you can see, uh, yeah, that one. Yeah, it maybe it's a bit harder to see, but uh, this piece I've stitched together um, linen and canvas um, panels, and then. Uh, just with my mum's old sewing machine in my studio and um, I've stretched it over this very large canvas um, and linen and canvas are really interesting materials because they have the very gentle um, differences but that makes a big difference on how um, you, you work uh, and so it's sort of something only once you've actually worked on both materials you sort of understand the differences but I wanted to exaggerate the differences in each of these um, common like artist canvases. And so I've applied this uh, slick glossy layer over the top of it. Um, so it exaggerates the texture of each of them. But uh, what I was interested in is, is my own incapability of actually constructing a piece itself. And so all my dodgy um, seamstress work is very visible and um, it's sort of the point of interest once looking at uh, physical objects. Uh, yeah, I just get excited by it. <laughs> no, it's great. I, I think, it, you know, it's a great way of just demonstrating to people, you know, the form itself, what goes into each piece for any of the artists in our show, really. It's, you know, what, remember that these are moments in time where someone has marked the page in a certain way they have you know these are choices that are being made um and once that's displayed on the screen you're seeing something through a, a prism that is no longer its true self and um i guess that you know the point for us is that's why it's so important to get out and see these things uh, when when people have the opportunity to do so and um appreciate their full value and and the choice choices that is made every time an artist touches that canvas 
Um, well, thank you so much for that. It's really, you know, it's really interesting. I do encourage people to check out more and more of stuff, and I'm excited to see what comes next. For you, obviously, you've kind of eschewed the whole figurative work. Is this something you'll keep toying with this concept and taking this further, do you think? Or um, will you move on to something completely, completely new? No, no, no. I feel like this is um, something that keeps me excited and inspired uh, to go into the studio. So no, this is definitely my um, the path I want to pursue. Right. Just yeah, just keep picking away at those different different concepts. We'll be yeah, it would be really fascinating to see what comes next. So thank you so much, Morgan. I'm going to welcome back our other artists just to. Um, say thank you for all of that just so you know everyone if you're looking to find the details we've got to put them in the chat but that was meg gallagher josh dykraft and morgan stokes they're all in room three of our virtual edition and um thank you so much all three of you and i hope to see you again very soon <laughs>